Do you do certain medications? Well, this anime is about a woman that does a lot of medication, if you know what I mean. And no, I'm not talking about marijuana. Mau Mau is a young apothecary with a hunger for adventure and a taste for disaster. She has learned so much about medicines, potions, and she even experiments on herself to the point that she has scars all over her body. She gets involved in an unfortunate kidnapping incident and has to spend the next couple of years in the Emperor's house with four baby mamas. Crazy, isn't it? Glistening and expressive, what beautiful eyes we see for a first scene. A beautiful young woman who we can tell has learned all her apothecary skills from her father squats on a field of different flowers, if this is how farm girls are. I might grab me one for a wife. She is summoned by her father and told to deliver medicine to the Vertigris house. She's got this nonchalant bad girl voice and this looks in her eyes that keeps me wondering. She's the protagonist, of course. Her father tells her she should be careful of kidnappers, right after we see a 30 milliseconds glimpse of her being kidnapped. She rushes over to the Vertigris house. It looks like a palace, but we clearly see people being extorted of their own money. All I can see in the Vertigris house are beautiful and well-endowed, eye-catching and properly endowed women, okay? Maybe I was wrong. I think it's a brothel. I forgot to mention, her name is Mao Mao, our cute young protagonist. She races out of the Vertigris house and gets to a field of flowers. She's kidnapped as she was busy admiring the flowers on the field. Three months later and Mao Mao finds herself in the rare palace, a special palace for the women who are to give birth to the emperor's children. Obviously men aren't allowed unless you're the emperor. His kin and a royal eunuch. Mao Mao gives direction to a fellow servant who is an illiterate. The servants here are mostly illiterates and are only taught the normal etiquettes in order for them to please the concubines in the rare palace. High-catching and sweet-looking servants can also become prospective baby mamas for the emperor and his kin. Eyesores remain servants. Mao Mao is pretty, but she has no endowment. She makes ironing boards jealous. While washing, Mao Mao is told about a beautiful eunuch. And to be honest, this guy is too good-looking to be a eunuch. She's also told about the deaths of the children of the emperor and how the two newborn prince and princess are also sick. Mao Mao speculated that it's not a curse, but just a not well-diagnosed illness or a poison. Curiosity beats Mao Mao, and she goes in to check what's going on with the emperor's children. She runs into a gathering of people. We hear a resounding slap. It's the mother of the prince dusting the face of the mother of the princess, saying she cursed her child because she gave birth to a boy and she gave birth to a girl. Mao Mao notices something that the royal physician and I couldn't place our finger on. Even after watching the scene over and over again, she mumbles in a way to notify the people of the palace as she makes her way out of there. Well, I don't know if a child died or something, but we see a woman crying heavily on the floor while it rains cats and dogs. Yes, painfully, the male child passed away. The beautiful eunuch converses with the mother of the female child about a written note found by the window of the physician. It's written on the note a powder being used on the babies is poison and should be kept away from the children. The baby mama wants the anonymous tipper to be found. The beautiful eunuch remembers that at the commotion a while ago, he hears a young lady murmur to herself about writing something. He smirks devilish with a spice of trouble. The serving girls are summoned by the beautiful eunuch. You know how girls are. At the sight of him, they act like butter in need of spreading. Knowing in fully well that the serving girls are illiterates, the beautiful eunuch writes on a paper saying they should wait. He then says out loud that they can all go. Mao Mao is the only serving girl left standing. The beautiful eunuch tells her to quietly follow him. She pushes his hand off her shoulder and dusts her shoulder. The beautiful eunuch takes Mao Mao to the mother of the princess, the only surviving child. She thanks her for saving her daughter's life. Mao Mao tries to deny, but the beautiful eunuch clears her straight up with the facts he has gathered. She tells them she's an apothecary and knows a little about poison. Mao Mao is promoted to be the lady-in-waiting for the baby mama. The mother of the princess is Lady Gyukuyu. Sorry, my bad. It's concubine Gyukuyu. A report which entails that the soldiers were poisoned by some hoodlums using the food cooked by the community was sent from the soldiers' camp to the beautiful eunuch. The messenger asks the beautiful eunuch about the new lady-in-waiting that concubine Gyokuyu hired. The beautiful eunuch devices, a delusional way to keep Mao Mao in check. Mao Mao is to report to the JP Pavilion, which is the territory of concubine Gyokuyu, She's interrupted by the beautiful eunuch who tries to use his charms to seduce Mao Mao. But bro, Mao Mao was not even moved. She felt an instant irritation and continues her movement to the Jade Pavilion. She arrives at the Jade Pavilion and meets Hong Niang. 
head of the lady-in-waiting. Mao Mao is given a tour of the Jade Pavilion. She's introduced to other lady-in-waiting. Mao Mao is summoned by Lady Gyoku Yu and the beautiful eunuch. She's told that she'll be testing the concubine's food before the concubine eats. I'm sorry, I keep calling her Lady Gyoku Yu. It's concubine Gyoku Yu. The tray of food is brought to Mao Mao. She's not testing the food. She's just enjoying her meal with her eyes closed. If I say it's testing, I'm lying. This is pure sensual evaluation. Mao Mao informs Lady Gyoku Yu to switch to silver plates because they react to poison. The concubine tells her that she already knew. She just wanted to test her. Mao Mao is so bored because she has nothing to do except for her sensual evaluation. This girl does not know what he has done for her. If I had the chance and her knowledge of poison, I'll be enjoying the king's meal. The beautiful eunuch, I just found out his name though. Oh shit. Can't remember right now, I'll tell you later when I remember. The beautiful eunuch summons Mao Mao and tries to use his looks to charm her. Nothing for him. The beautiful eunuch tries to make Mao Mao eat buns laced with aphrodisiac, but she notices it and realizes he just tried to trick her. Concubine Gyoku Yu laughs out loud. I think she knows what the eunuch was planning. Guy thinks he's smart. The beautiful eunuch tells her about the incident in the soldier camp. Mao Mao explains to them that the rear palace is filled with plants that have poisoned in them. The beautiful eunuch asks if she could make an aphrodisiac. Mao Mao is overjoyed because she loves to do experiments with plants. Mao Mao is a mad scientist in the making. I've remembered the beautiful eunuch's name. His name is Jinshi. Okay, I can't let this slide. I don't know. If you've watched the anime Hunter x Hunter, if you have, then you know how Hisoka drools over Kilua and Gan. That's the same way Jinshi drools over Mao Mao because she looks at him condescendingly. I don't understand why anime characters have weird obsessions. The next day, Mao Mao is taken to the paper room. I actually mistook the room for a herbs room because we know she has a fetish for everything connected to Mother Nature by root. Her face literally glows up. It's like she has just walked into heaven. It's like that euphoric feeling you get when you're holding big juicy watermelons after a long time. Forgive me. She's so happy to be using the paper so freely pen and paper I've been running from all my life. Mao Mao proceeds to make the aphrodisiac. She makes it into a chocolate pills and has a little leftover syrup that she makes into little chocolate cupcakes for herself. She sets out to deliver the aphrodisiac pills to Jinshi, but gets distracted by medicinal plants on a small field in the rear palace. By the time she gets back to the palace, a few ladies already had the aphrodisiac and are going crazy. She delivers the pills to Jinshi. The concubine requests Mao Mao to make some for the emperor. Just before Jinshi leaves, he touches Mao Mao's braided hair and kisses her hair. I can't tell if it's just her imagination. Did the aphrodisiac get to her? Okay, let's see where the so-called beautiful eunuch is taking this. Jinshi tells a woman something and she runs out of the room crying. I think she's one of the emperor's baby mama. The next scene, a serving girl is attacked by something believed to be a spirit. The rumor goes round the place that there's an evil spirit going around the rear palace and killing people. But as usual, Mao Mao makes nothing of it. Mao Mao goes to the royal physician's place and she's perplexed because a while ago he was so wary of her. And now he even makes her tea. Why is he so laid back? Just about to take tea and cookies from the physician, that evil spirit called Jinshi shows up and says he wants some, and the physician goes to bring some more. She didn't get to take any. Jinshi asks her if she knows anything about sleepwalking, and she denies and says it has nothing to do with medicine, but Jinshi persists and, well, she gave in to do what she can. Wait, that means Jinshi knows the so-called sleepwalker that's killing people in the name is evil spirit. Nightfall, Jinshi's assistant walks Mao Mao somewhere. During transit, he tells her to stop looking at eunuch Jinshi like he's a woman eating maggot. I still don't understand why he's touched by her condescending looks. I'm beginning to think that guy is packing down there. Jinshi's assistant leads her to see the so-called evil spirit. It's a beautiful princess that's been... Wait, she's very pretty and she's dancing on top of a wall with a dress that glows under the moonlight. It's serene. Both Mao Mao and I are in amazed. The princess has been neglected by the emperor because she's supposedly said to be a wonderful dancer, but she tripped while dancing for him. Ever since then, the emperor just threw her aside and has now decided to marry her off to a military man. Ever since the news reached her about the marriage, she's been sleepwalking, dancing, and attacking people at night. She's the wandering evil spirit. I feel so bad for her. Mao Mao is informed about all this, and she requests to see her to know more about her condition. Mao Mao goes to spy on the princess with Jinshi's assistant. She returns and tells concubine Gyokuyu and Jinshi about a, the same sleepwalking she encountered in the Vertigris house. 
She speculates that the sleepwalking is caused by stress, and the princess would stop sleepwalking if the wedding with the military man was cancelled. Concubine Gyokuyu and Jinshi nods in agreement, and Mao Mao takes her leave. The princess is called Lady Fuyu. Lady Fuyu is confined to her room till the day of her bestowal. Eunuchs are kept to watch her. Mao Mao wonders if that's a good decision. Concubine Gyokuyu notices that Mao Mao has been behaving strangely. After a while, Concubine Gyokuyu confronts Mao Mao and tells her that Mao Mao could tell her anything. I guess Mao Mao is behaving out of the norm because what she said is not what they did. Mao Mao tells Concubine Gyokuyu a story about another courtesan at the Vertigris house and likens it to that of Lady Fuyu. As they speak, Lady Fuyu takes her leave to her bestowal. I don't know if I should be sad for her. Mao Mao makes a crazy speculation. She tells Concubine Gyokuyu, that since Lady Fuyu and the military officer are from the same town, it is possible that they both had feelings for each other. And Lady Fuyu foiled her presentation to the emperor on purpose so he wouldn't touch her, knowing fully well that as a military man, he could not propose to a princess. The military man at the best opportunity to chose a reward for himself, strongly requested for Lady Fuyu. It is possible that Lady Fuyu faked her sleepwalking, so that the Emperor does not grow a sudden interest in her because she wants to be with the military man and does not want to ruin her chance to be with her love. With that being said, it's still all speculations. The gates are opened and Lady Fuyu sees the military man and her dim face lights up. They walk out like lovebirds. So Mao Mao's speculations were actually true. Concubine Gyokuyu states that she's jealous of Lady Fuyu. Truth to be told though, the military officer is a fine man. What I was expecting was not what I saw at all. The emperor visits the Jade Pavilion to see the concubine with the surviving child. Mao Mao carries out her regular sensory evaluation of the food before the emperor and concubine dig in. As she gets up to leave, the emperor requests she takes care of concubine Li Hua, who lost her male child. This scares Mao Mao, who had never seen the emperor with her two eyes before, not to even talk of him speaking to her. Mao Mao reports to the Crystal Pavilion to treat concubine Li Hua, but her ladies-in-waiting reject the medicine for their so-called concubine, saying Lady Li Hua cannot be fed such lowly food. Honestly, with this attitude, this concubine is going to lose another child soon. That's if God smiles down on her arrogant self with another. Mao Mao tries again two days in a row and gets kicked out by the ladies-in-waiting. In fact, concubine Lihua chokes on the so-called very nutritious meal her servants feed her, and Mao Mao instantly gets blamed for it. Mao Mao gives it another try. The beautiful eunuch shows up to finally be useful with his charms. He charms concubine Lihua's servants into letting Mao Mao examine their mistress. Mao Mao finally examines concubine Lihua and finds out that the same poisonous powder that killed her child was still being used on her as makeup. Mao Mao walks up to where the lady-in-waiting is and asks who was in charge of the makeup. I thought she was going to report to the emperor, but what small and feeble a mind I possess. Just before we know what is going on, Mao Mao gives her a resounding, well-deserved face dusting. Mao Mao pulls her by the hair and takes her where the makeup is and pours the powder all over her and gives her the details on how the powder is going to make her sick, just like her mistress. This high and mighty wimp of a servant starts crying. Mao Mao begins to give off Aaron Yeager vibes, subtle voice, half-opened bossy eyelids, beating up the weak, I mean, the wrong. The classic Aaron Yeager justice. She begins to give out orders like, she is the empress herself. Truly respect is given to those that deserve it. And also, the lady-in-waiting is put behind bars. Concubine Lihua gets better after a while. Mao Mao is tired. Of course, she's probably working two pavilions. While she suns the laundry, Jinshi and his assistant bring gifts for their favorite apothecary. Mao Mao uses her high and mighty demeaning charms to get Jinshi to prepare a steam bath for concubine Lihua. Truly, lust is blind. Mao Mao sits beside concubine Lihua, watching over her. Concubine Lihua questions why Mao Mao would not let her die. Mao Mao replies, saying if she wanted to die, she could have stopped eating the food she was being fed. The lady-in-waiting was released from confinement, and she was so happy to see her mistress in good shape. They actually care for their mistress, but ignorance, arrogance, and stupidity would have let them kill this fine, mouth-watering, and sumptuous-looking concubine. 
I see why she was the Emperor's favorite. After a while, Concubine Lihua was able to move around. Mao Mao informs Concubine Lihua that she would be taking her leave the day after. The Concubine puts forth her concerns and insecurity about being able to birth again. Mao Mao advises she gives it a try. The Concubine tells Mao Mao that she is not sure the Emperor would want her anymore. She compares herself with Mao Mao's mistress. Mao Mao tells her that she was sent by the Emperor to take care of her and also tells her she has powerful men-attracting qualities that Lady Gyokuyu lacks. Mao Mao whispers a certain secret she learned from the Verdigris brothel house that Mao Mao herself cannot use because even she lacks the endowment concubine Lihua possesses. Mao Mao returns to the Jade Palace and receives a warm welcome from her fellow lady-in-waiting. The Crystal Pavilion has better-looking servants. Well, I guess concubine Jokuyu chose brains over the dumb beauties that concubine Lihua settled for. The Emperor's visit to the Jade Pavilion reduced drastically. Now we know our Emperor loves his jolly melons, just like I do. Flashes of wood being burnt and voila, we discover that another curse is born. The doctor goes in to bring what's required to prepare their sumptuous meal, and while they savor their mushroom meal, the man from the first scene with the cursed hands shows up and asks if they can make a cure for his curse. Mao Mao makes an ointment while he enlightens us all about the newly arrived curse. It all began two nights ago. You know the story already began. He was doing his usual duty of burning the waste that comes out of the rare palace. I have come to the conclusion that nothing good comes out of that part of the palace. It's called rare for a reason. When a wooden tablet wrapped in a burnt woman's clothes fell from the trash, he picked it up in curiosity but goes ahead to throw it into the fire anyway. And all of a sudden, the flames of the fire increased and the color of the flames changed just like when spellcasters cast a spell and during manifestation the flames would change color. I hope they have not introduced witchcraft into this. Mamau puts on a little magic show lighting a fire stick and changing its color, explaining how certain compounds cause fire to change its color. She tells him that the reaction on his hands is probably to a certain compound on the wooden tablets. We hear applause. It's Jinshi. He takes her aside and questions her about the magic show she put on, and just as she's about to leave, he tells her he likes his own steam boiled, the mushroom that is. Mao Mao walks in on a garden party preparation at the Jade Pavilion. She's given a new dress, and enlightened on how the king is unmarried and has not for himself an empress consort, making it customary for all four of the high-ranking concubines to be present at the party. If you ask me, I would just tell you that the emperor is just keeping his option. I'm sure the emperor has to roll dice just to select who he's going to spend time with. Mao Mao makes arrangements for the difficulties she is likely to face at the garden party event. She makes sweets to increase blood flow and keep her warm, she also makes an inner vest to keep her warm using warm stones. A lady-in-waiting walks in on her and inquires about what she was doing. And that's how our selfless Mao Mao makes more than a dozen inner vests for a lot of people, the Emperor's seamstress herself. Mao Mao needs more credit for the work she's putting in for this ungrateful rare palace occupants. Concubine Gyokuyu adds a little extra finesse on her ladies, she decorates them with jewelry on the day of the party. Jinshi goes about greeting the high-ranking concubines. He greets concubine Gyokuyu last. I know he is like a holy castrated playboy, but he gives the best compliments. He doesn't even recognize Mao Mao with her freckles off. Apparently, she puts on freckles to avoid being dragged down an alley and messed with. Mao Mao shares her story of how she was kidnapped and sold. She expresses how it angers her. Jinshi seems sympathetic and gives her his hairpin in disguise of patting her hair. Jinshi for the first time keeps a straight face. It's so unlike him. Jinshi takes his leave and Mao Mao takes off the hairpin, and she wonders why he gave her a man's hairpin. Wait, men have hairpins? The other ladies in waiting gather around Mao Mao to admire the pin and act like me when I see my girl take off her bra. Excitement! Concubine Gyokuyu takes the pin from Mao Mao and puts it back in her hair. She tells Mao Mao that she is no longer hers alone, just as Mao Mao tries to ask what she meant by that. The party drums are played to signify the beginning of the party. I can feel some kind of drama about to flare up, and I can't wait to know what is going to happen. So cold, the ladies in waiting cling unto themselves for warmth assisted by the hot stones. It's crazy the fact that they kept these fine young concubine assistants out here to die of cold, 
Meanwhile, the emperor and his concubines sit in the comfort of their tents, listening to music and enjoying the show. Concubine Li Hua's lady in waiting criticizes concubine Gyokuyu's lady in waiting for being so classless. These flimsy, illiterate, and dare I say foolish women don't remember Mao Mao's face because her freckles are gone and she's got a little makeup on, just as Yinghua, Mao Mao's fellow lady in waiting, mentions her name, fear strikes their heart and PTSD of the little fun they had with Mau Mau flushes their brain. They all run like the brainless chickens they are. They just look good for eating. Nothing up there. Mau Mau mentions that it's about time they change their pocket warmers, and her fellow lady-in-waiting gets delusional about how nicely Mau Mau treats them. A clash between ladies-in-waiting of different concubines is called a proxy war, and concubine Aduo and Lishu's lady-in-waiting are at it. Mao Mao is informed that concubine Aduo is 35 years old and concubine Li Shu is 14 years old. There's no way I can relate this to anything because how can you be a mother-in-law by the age of nine? Mao Mao and the rest of us are sent into complete and absolute shock finding out that the previous emperor that died five years ago was Lady Li Shu's master. She became a mother-in-law to concubine Aduo while only at the age of nine and now concubine Li Shu is a concubine to the new emperor, meaning concubine Li Shu and Aduo are concubines to the new emperor. I have already developed a headache just explaining this. Mao Mao holds her mistress's child, just as the young concubine Li Shu walks by and gives her the looks. A hairpin is handed to someone, and Mao Mao wonders why. She's told it's how they recruit talented servants in the rear palace, or maybe it has another meaning. Some dude we've never seen before comes over with a stash of hairpins on his waist like Batman's utility waist belt and gives Mao Mao a pin that looks like wood or bronze. It's not attractive or good looking at all. As soon as he takes his leave, the other lady in waiting appears, asking about the ugly hairpin. Concubine Li Hua comes with her lady in waiting and blesses Mao Mao with a wonderful, very pretty hairpin. It's about time Mao Mao does her job. Sensory evaluation, but before the food and juice arrive, she sights an array of soldiers and sees Jin Chi's assistant amongst them and also the guy that gave her the ugly hairpin. Juice is first served, followed by fish and vegetable dish. Mao Mao enjoys her job, but the other food testers eat with dread on their faces. The fear of death is one that has but a tight grip on them, and before you know it, Mao Mao is served a soup to taste. And with the flush on her face and licking of her lips, you would wonder how sweet the food tastes, not knowing that it's laced with poison. Mao Mao stands up and informs the crowd that the food is poisoned and runs out to cure herself. Hold up, wait. Did he just say poison? The minister, so dumb and full of lack of wisdom, walked in and tested the food and collapsed. He was just informed of the poison, was he not? But a man must make sure that she's not lying with his own life. Jin Shi sees Mao Mao running and follows her. He calls out to her, and she greets him with nothing but a mischievous smile on her face. You won't believe that this fellow human being like you and I just ate poison. Jinchi grabs her by the hand and tells her he's taking her to the infirmary. She requests the remainder of the soup, and Jinchi, wondering just how stupid she is, tells her that a minister tried the soup and has collapsed. She immediately gives him an antidote from inside her garment. He grabs it off her and continues walking holding her hand. Mao Mao requests concubine Li Shu and her food tester after she is treated by the infirmary. Mao Mao questions concubine Li Shu if she could eat fish. Jin Shi queries why she is asking that, and Mao Mao explains that people have certain foods that they can't eat because their body reacts to it in deadly ways. Concubine Li Shu confirms that she can't eat fish, and Mao Mao goes back into Aaron Yeager mode once more chastising and telling the food tester what to and what not to feed her mistress. I was honestly thinking that she wanted to question them about trying to poison concubine Gyokuyu. But somehow, somewhere, Mao Mao concludes that the food was mixed up because of the way it was cooked. Concubine Li Shu takes her leave with her concubine. Mao Mao wonders if her poor dad is fine. She hasn't heard jack shit from him since she was kidnapped and sold off. Mao Mao was instructed to take the day off because of the poison incident during the garden party, but she's got the head of a bull. She gets up midday and tells her mistress she'd like to be of use. Concubine Gyokuyu informs her that Jinshi's servant is around and would like to see her. She heads to the parlor to see him. He gives her the meal from yesterday, which was laced. She takes powder and runs a forensic test on it, making fingerprints visible on it, and she decodes fast that it was touched by four persons. The person that dished it, the transporter, concubine Lishu's tester, and the poisoner. At this point, 
I had to adjust my seat because things were beginning to get very interesting. Jinchi's assistant wonders why the food tester touched the plate already. Mao Mao explains that concubine Lishu's lady in waiting is trying to bully concubine Lishu. She further explains that first they made her wear colors contrasting the Jade Pavilion, and then switched the food in order to further bully the concubine. I don't get the messed up explanation here, but it all has something to do with concubine Lishu getting married to the son of her former master and the indecency it entails. So her own ladies-in-waiting are bullying her? The concubine is just 14 years old for crying out loud. Jinchi's assistant questions why she didn't spill the beans on those stupid lady-in-waiting bullying their own master. Jinchi's assistant reports back to his master and gives him the tea about what's going on. Jinchi is relaxed now that he has gotten his cup filled. He decides to rest his head since he hasn't gotten any rest since the incident occurred. His assistant reminds him to remove his hairpin so it won't break while he rests, and these two conniving master and assistant mention something like Jinshi hiding his true identity. Mao Mao goes and visits her servant friend, bringing her delicious meals as always. Her friend mentions something about the hairpins that she's received, and it piques our interest to the fullest. Apparently, if you're given a pin, you could use it to see someone inside or outside the rear palace, and it could also assist you in leaving the rear palace temporarily. Mao Mao runs and requests to see the man who gave her a hairpin at the garden party. He remembers her face from the food poison incident and decides he's going to decline whatever she requests. I'm just laughing. He doesn't know she's going to pull up with some Aaron Yeager level of bargain that's going to leave him with nothing but reasons to accept her offer. She arrives at the meeting point, and he tries to act all high and mighty, a low-ranking soldier for that matter. He is raising shoulders. She tells him she'd like him to vouch for her so she can go home, and just as he lays down his foundation to say no, she stops him and puts a well-polished, mouth-watering, once-in-a-lifetime, every-man's-dream opportunity on the table telling him he is going to get access to not just one, not just two, but three high class from the Vertigris house. Of course, he doubts. She finesses her offer, telling him she's got other people who would take her offer without blinking an eye. She shows him two of her very fancy hairpins that send a message to his empty skull. I can't believe they're still discussing. We would probably be on the way to the Vertigris house by now. By the time Jinshi recovers and comes visiting at the Jade Pavilion, Mao Mao already left on a three-day homecoming journey. You need to see the look on this guy's face as they ride back home, the jolly big smile and melody he's singing. I thought he was doing hard guy. Stupid goat. As a big boy, he uses a carriage to take her home. Man's gotta come in grand style. They arrive at the Vertigris house, and Granny welcomes Mao Mao with nothing but a high knee kick on her stomach. Mao Mao explains to her traveling companion that it's their normal way of greeting. Granny welcomes their customer and sends Mao Mao home, and now I see where Mao Mao gets her nonchalant attitude from. The looks and all. Because how can your child who has been away for 10 months straight walk back home and you'll act like nothing happened? Like she's been gone for just two extra hours that you sent her out. I can't even spend a night out without letting my parents know. Or the next day they'll be missing posters all the way half across the earth. Mao Mao fills her dad in on all the adventures she's been having, and from the look on his face, Something's cooking. Something big is cooking. And I can't wait to see what big reveal is coming up in a few episodes from now. Mao Mao wakes up to the moist air in her room. She's gotten so used to the rear palace already. She goes to the field with her father in mind, wondering why he won't stop working the field. We hear an aggressive knock on the door. Mao Mao rushes over and tells the little girl she saw not to break down her door. The little girl grabs Mao Mao by the hand and takes her to her workplace. A lady and a man, consume it poison. The man is lying lifeless while the lady is finding it really difficult to breathe. Mao Mao rushes to the scene and tells the courtesan, who is doing all she can to sustain these two sinners, that she should check the lady if anything is clogging her throat. Mao Mao checks the man and sees there's nothing clogging his throat and proceeds to give him CPR. The courtesan follows suit and gives the lady CPR. She calls out for water, but Mao Mao said they should bring coal instead. Charcoal, Mao Mao exclaims on how great a start of the morning that was for her. A courtesan walks in and tells her that the two victims are stable. Mao Mao instructs them not to touch anything at the scene. The courtesans leave, and Mao Mao stays behind to investigate the scene. Just as she puts her clues together, the little girl that came over to call her from home walks in with coal in her hands. Mao Mao tells the girl to go and fetch her father from the field. As the little girl walks out, 
She gives a mischievous, creepy, and alarming look. Mau Mau doesn't notice the look on the girl's face. The little girl returns with Mau Mau's father a little bit late. Mau Mau's dad explains that the little girl kept worrying about his foot. A medicine is prepared and given to the victims. Mau Mau's dad compliments her skills, saying her treatment is not bad. Not bad, huh? Mau Mau's dad asks her what type of poison she thinks it is. Mau Mau explains that tobacco leaves are deadly poisons. That's why she didn't give them water because it would make things worse. But Mau Mau's dad asks her what if the poison was already dissolved in water. Mau Mau immediately realizes that there's no tobacco in the vomit. That means someone poisoned them, but who? Mau Mau and her father were rewarded by the head of the brothel. Mau Mau speculates that the incident might have been double suicide. A man who's not wealthy enough to buy out the courtesan and a courtesan with a long time left in her term can both reach the same conclusion. It's not something that's new in this area, but the man was well-dressed. He doesn't look like someone who's short on money. Mau Mau excuses herself to go and check on the victims, and to our greatest surprise, we see that little girl doing something ridiculous. She was about to use a knife to end the man's life. So she's the one behind all this? No wonder she's got this look in her eyes like she doesn't just care but has no choice but to do as she's told. Right from when she saw Mau Mau at home, Mau Mau quickly rushes over and grabs the knife from her hand. She tries to fight back. Mau Mau headbutts her, and she begins to cry out loud. When they say Mau Mau is strong-headed, she took it literally. A courtesan nearby who heard the cry ran in to inquire on what's going on. The courtesan explains to Mau Mau that the man is a bad person who goes around sweet-talking courtesans, telling them he will buy them out, but just at the nick of time, he would abandon them. He did so to that little girl and she can't forgive. A lot of courtesans also want him dead. He's been stabbed and poisoned before, but his rich father covers it up. Mao Mao can't seem to get it off her mind. She wonders why a wealthy person like that would want to commit suicide, or was it forced suicide? Mao Mao thinks out loud, and her father tells her not to talk out of conjecture. Mao Mao sits back to think on what happened and all the clues in the scene. She then realizes it's not a double suicide, it's murder. Someone who has been poisoned before won't easily take wine from a courtesan, so the courtesan used the immiscibility of two different wines to poison. She poured in the pure wine, and then poured in the poisoned wine, which formed two different layers, the poison and the non-poison. She uses a straw to sip out of the non-poison, because it is settled at the bottom of the cup, and gives him the cup, and he gulps down the remaining wine in the cup. She also gives herself a very small portion of the wine, just enough so it won't kill her. Fear women, I beg you in the name of God, fear women. Mau Mau takes a stroll around the area. She doubts everyone in the brothel, including the little girl, because why would she first run to an apothecary shop and not to the doctor? Her three days homecoming journey is over. Mau Mau takes her leave in the morning. She goes to the Vertigris house to pick up her guarantor, who I know would have had a wonderful time. If not that I'm a Christian, an anime character would not be beating me at this. Mau Mau arrives at the Jade Pavilion and greets everyone. Jinchi tells her that he'll be waiting for her in the parlor. A shiver runs down her body like they just poured cold water on her. She arrives at the parlor where Jinchi was patiently waiting. They have a very petty conversation about how Jinchi lost to a consolation prize because he was the first to give her a hairpin. In the midst of their little conversation, it piques Jinchi's interest that she gave her guarantor a repayment. He quickly asks what the repayment was. Mao Mao tells Jinchi that she blessed him with a night of blissful dreams. This foolish apothecary girl does not understand the gravity of her words. A tiny little banquet, and we see a few people make bad jokes about a man who sits at the corner all on his own, drinking to stupor, breaking the bottles, and requesting more wine. We see a hand put something white into a bottle and take it to the lone man who immediately gulps everything. Jinshi's assistant brings more paperwork for his master, but his master still sobs over what he heard. Jinshi's assistant recalls the relief his master had when he was told the payback Mao Mao gave to her guarantor was high-ranking courtesans and not her body. Jinshi finally raises his head and decides to work. A short while after, a man runs in and reports that the drunk lone man was dead. Jinshi and his assistant make haste to see what happened. Jinshi goes to the Jade Pavilion to inform concubine Gyokuyu about what happened. He asks Mao Mao about the cause of death. Mao Mao informs him that excessive drinking can be poisonous. She's given a sample of the booze and immediately she sees the booze. Her whole countenance lights up like she has just been offered the lottery of a lifetime. Jinchi explains how good of a man he was, how the man raised Jinchi, 
and how he suddenly developed a sweet tooth. She ruins his nostalgia and pours more booze for her to drink. I honestly can't think of a reason why you'd like your booze salty. Mau Mau doesn't really like the distinct taste of the sweet and saltiness of the wine. She asks if there was any salt available at the party. Jinshi tells her all the kinds of salt that were available, like, for example, Mooncake pointed out that one cause I find it weird. Mau Mau requests they bring the last jar that the man drank from, though it was broken, and she also made a special request. Jinshi and his servant return with what Mau Mau asked for. Just look how important our little apothecary girl of episode one is now. She explains to them that a dangerous amount of salt was added to the man's booze. Salt is often poisonous when consumed in large quantities. The man didn't notice because he already lost his taste buds for salt. Her special request was for his medical report, and in there, it was stated that he lost his ability to taste salt. So, it is most likely that someone kept adding salt to his booze to spike him, but he didn't notice. So they continued. Who did this? It's not Mao Mao's problem anymore. Jinshi gets up to take his leave, but he turns around to reward Mao Mao with a bottle of booze. He gives off a reaction as Mao Mao tells him to return to work. She notices and tells him to work else papers will pile up. He teases her dumb ass about a bill that proposes a ban on underage drinking, setting the age limit to 20. Mao Mao pleads for him not to approve of it. Jinshi turns and takes his leave anyway, with Mao Mao begging him still while holding his dress. We see a short clip of a body falling deep into a water body. We don't know if it was suicide or murder, but it's every day somebody is dying in this anime now. The physician is called upon, and luckily Mao Mao was with him at that moment. They rush over to the dead body, and the physician whimpers like a little girl. I still don't know how the whole rear palace didn't perish with this incompetent doctor. Mao Mao explains as Master Jinshi arrives that her teacher told her not to touch corpses because if she eventually touches one, her curiosity might let her begin to dig up graves just so she can run tests. Mao Mao notices the corpse's fingers and toes. Jinshi speculates later on that it was suicide, but Mao Mao thinks it's not necessarily suicide. Well, actually, the walls of the palace are really tall. One might need ladders and one might not. She continues to explain that from the incident of the ghost, she's been thinking of how concubine Fu Yu climbed the wall to do her little displays. One day, Mao Mao found stepping stones on the walls, but it will be very difficult for a servant like the corpse to climb because her feet are bound. Mao Mao thinks it's murder. A while after rumors spread, notes were found and it was passed off as suicide. Mao Mao makes an outrageous request from Jinshi, saying if he's either assigned to kill her, he should do it with poison. What the hell does this even mean? Thanks for watching, fellow weebs. If you enjoyed this recap, dive into the next video or playlist, and don't forget to check out our cool anime hoodies in the description below. See you in the next recap.